Okay, Rute. Yeah. So, did you have a good break from Greek? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to think about it this week. Now we'll pick back up for a little bit. And what we'll do is we'll spend just a few more minutes on 1 John chapter 1 and kind of show what we're trying to accomplish there. And then we're going to move on to looking at some other kinds of verbs. We've been mainly focusing on indicative verbs because what they do is they show reality. Then we're going to move outside of reality. So let's uh, go to the exercise here. And I do have this on this screen. All right. So we looked at verse 1. And uh, after I gave it some more thought, um, they may have that misidentified. The text receptors may have that right. Uh, because what we really need to do when we get to an interlinear is not look at any words until you find your main verb. So that's what I'd say is your first, um, first objective, is to look for your main verb. And you really don't find it until you get way down... Sorry, just a second. Yeah, what verse is that? Here we go. You don't get it until you verse, get to verse 2. We testify and proclaim um, the life of the Lord. Yep. Uh, so really what you're doing is you're saying, here's, every, here's what we testify and have seen, and it's all that stuff before it. Um, We'll talk more about relative clauses. That's what pushes the verb, main verb all the way down. But I want to skip down, I think, to verse number five, because I think that'll be a simpler verse for us to spend some time with. All right. Um, so we have and, and what, what we do is we just kind of scan across, and here we have a verb, P-A-I. Does anyone remember what the P stand for? Present. Uh, usually, what time is the present? It's now. It's present. Uh, active. The subject is giving or receiving the action? Giving the action. Uh, in this case, it's stative. It's a to be verb, um, is. But the indicative then tells you what? If it's indicative, it's reality. That's the word we're attaching to indicative. So this is something that is happening right now, or at least is portrayed as ongoing, which when you're talking about is, he is, or it is, uh, usually you're talking about some kind of uh, picture of ongoing activity. Um, you know, he was, you could cease to become, be something, but with he is, you're probably talking about a real continuous state that he is a man. That's not going to change, no matter what the culture is telling you. He is a man, he is a man, and he's continuously a man, a state of being there, and he really is, because it's in the indicative. Now, what we have here is that we have a very common conjunction, and, um, or you can almost translate it as now, notice that they're not even translating it. They're giving you nothing there, because they see it as just showing the next paragraph, in essence. But you have is. What is? Well... You find your subject. You've got a nominative. This is. Uh, this is what? This is, and you have another nominative. Remember how we talked about if a verb is an equal sign, you're going to have a nominative on both sides, like I am he, not I am him. I am he. You put both in the subject. So this is, and then you have the other side of the equal sign. This is the message. This is the message. And what message? Well, it's the message that we have heard. Now, uh, when you get to this verb, notice that this is the message. Now, this is this relative clause. See the ASF? What does the A stand for? If you're accusative. Now, we might think about this even from an English perspective. So, this... That's a subject, is, 
Here's your verb. The message. This is a predicate, actually, in English. It's still subjective case, but it's the predicate. It's what it is. This is the message. Let's say which or that, either one will work in English. Uh, there's some distinction there, and I've tried to figure it out in English, and it has to do with some kind of generality versus specificity, and I haven't quite figured it out exactly. If someone else can explain English grammar on that or which, which one you're supposed to use, I'd appreciate it. Uh, so, but this is the message, which or that, then uh, we have heard. Now, the question would be, what function or what case should which or that be? In English, we're lucky because it's either that or which, and you don't have to know if it's subjective, possessive, object, uh, possessive, it would actually be whose or something like that. But that or which, you don't know if it's a subjective or an objective, that is the subject or the object. In Greek, it, we get the answer. It is an accusative. Why do you think if you have subjective, subjective predicate, so this is the message, why do you switch to an object here with the relative, which or that? It's just the message become the object of the function, the verb, the adjective. There you go. Technically, this is a complete thought, isn't it? This is the message. Now you're just getting more information about the message. Here you have subject, verb in English. Subject, verb, here is your object. We have heard, we have heard what? Well, the message. So your which or that is going to be accusative. Now, in Greek, it gives you that information you know exactly that this is the object of some other verb. Uh, this is not the subject of this verb. It's not the object of this verb. It is the object of this verb. So you could almost break it up, and some translations would. This is the message. Uh, we have heard it. I don't necessarily like breaking up Greek sentences like that. In fact, this morning I'm going to preach through Ephesians. We're going to do a survey of that. And Ephesians 3, 1 through 14 is just a whole lot of that. <laughs> uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has uh, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In whom? In whom? In whom? In whom? In whom? And a lot of English translations will say, well, that gets a little too much like a run-on, so let's say in him. So put a period here, and then do in him, and continue. Greek will often have a lot of these add-on parts. So you got to find your main sentence, and then it starts to give you more information about that main sentence whenever you start adding all these additional things on. So which, notice that it's accusative singular feminine. Do you see anything before it that is singular feminine? Yeah, you have message is singular feminine. Now, this is a nominative because that's what it has to be in the this is the message. But here it switches. So you have your singular feminine saying the which here applies to the message, but now it's functioning differently. It is the object of this verb that follows it. That's the same thing we do in English. We just don't think through all of that most of the time. The, we have heard it. Well, what is the it? The message. So we can put it in one long clause by saying, this is the message which we have heard. That's what they do in Greek as well. So that's why some things are going to switch here. But the only thing I want us to think through again here is some of these verbs. When you see an R-A-I, I have it up there for you. What does the R mean? Perfect. When you see a perfect in Greek, what does it usually mean? Completed in the past? Ongoing relevance in the present. Usually a state. Um, here, this may be stative, that 
we are in a position of those who have heard, we are hearers, but I think more it's saying that we have heard and that continues to have relevance in the present, that that message is still echoing in our ears, if you will, um, that we have heard from him. But then drop down, let's look at this verb. Um, now notice which will still be, and these are connected by the and, so we have heard from him and announce to you, but when you look at this here, what has changed about our verb? Present. It's present. So it's almost like he's saying, we heard, has ongoing relevance in the present, and now, picking up again, with a present verb, we are announcing. So that message, we heard. It's still echoing in our ears, but now we are speaking that message to you. We're announcing that message to you. Notice how they have those little nuances there between shifting from the perfect of this still has ongoing relevance in my life, John says, and now I'm going to speak it to you so that you can hear it. And now you will have heard and it will have ongoing relevance for you in the future. Um, so those little nuances, I think, are, are helpful. And then he basically gives the content of that message that they had heard from the beginning and now announced to you that, well, it's almost like with the, this is the word oti, it's almost like you can think of that as uh, quotation marks in some ways. Uh, sometimes it's indirect speech, sometimes it's direct speech, but it's almost as saying, here's the message, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Um, so the, the main thing I want you to get from this is, yes, there are some things that just we don't think through a lot. Maybe it seems a little overwhelming, but the main point is you can now see some differences in the verbs. Just look for those verbs and see, why do you think he used a perfect here? Why do you think he used a present here? Who is the subject of this verb? Who is the object of this verb? He, he's All those little things we've touched on, and you can begin to start thinking about those ideas as you're reading through your interlinear of, well, you used a perfect. Maybe that means that there's some ongoing relevance for John. And he used a present. Maybe that means right now he wants to speak that same message. So you, you can start thinking through some of those little nuances as you look at your interlinear. Does anybody have any uh, thoughts on that before we move forward? Again, right now we're just learning terminology and starting to see some of the significance. Feel free to burn at the beginning of the show. That, I'll proceed. I'll post it again. I'll post it to you, sir. Conjugation. Conjugation. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Conjugation. Conjugation. We call that a demonstrative pronoun. Is that what that is? It's interesting that they don't change the word. Yeah. So, this is a little off topic, but I will talk about it. OT is very versatile. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it is a conjunction, but let me drop down here. Notice that it can be the substance of content, that. So like we would use that for indirect speech, we would say, he said that he is the Christ. Now, you could reframe that in English and say, he said, quotation marks, I am the Christ. And so you give the direct speech versus when you shift it to indirect, you say, he said that he is the Christ. And now you go to the third person. So you're telling your perspective on it. So OT can be that way. But the interesting thing about this conjunction, uh, why is it not showing me, giving me the option? Oh, there it is, show all there. You drop down, it's going to give you all the number one possibilities there and its comparisons to other ways that you could do that in Greek. Um, but I want to go to the next major one. Um, let's keep going. This is why I like uh, the little shorter lexicon. It doesn't make you wade through all this, though this is helpful for word studies at times. Um, in Greek, it can be used of direct discourse. And so we use quotation marks instead of OT, where they would use OT. Then it can be a conjunction meaning because, since, or for that, or for. And so it has a lot of possibilities. 
and you have to determine um, from context. I would say most of the time, if it's a he said, he prayed, he thought, it's probably giving you the content, either direct discourse or indirect discourse. If it's in a clause like he is the Christ because he did the miracles, it's there you're showing a causal idea rather than a content idea. But um, we'll, we'll also notice that with the word ina, um, uh, ina can be purpose in order that, or it can also be content of the content of a prayer, the content of something along those lines. And so it's like English. You've got that versatility with the word that. Of, and um, the thing about Greek is that most of the time you have different ways of presenting if it's a relative clause that, or if it's a direct discourse that, or if it's a causal that. Something in the context or even a different word altogether will be used to express that. And in fact, most of the time in Greek, when you have a relative clause, uh, that or who or something along those lines, uh, it could be the relative clause, as we saw, which has an actual relative pronoun, or it could be that we are inserting it in English because it's a participle. Like, um, So we would say, he who hears, they would do it as a participle, something like, uh, the hearing one. <laughs> and we don't translate it, the hearing one. We'd say the one who hears, or something along those lines. And so sometimes we even insert relative pronouns that aren't there in Greek because they're expressing it in a different way. But that can be content. Uh, that can be relative clause. That can be indirect discourse. It's English that is really creating even more versatility than Greek would. All right. Let's go back to our PowerPoint here. There we go. And again, I'm, I'll, I'll throw some extra things at you, but the main thing I want you to get is we're just learning some terminology on present, perfect, imperfect. What, what do those ideas hold for the Greek mind? Now, outside of the indicative, where you have reality with the indicative. So present active indicative is a, uh, he is running, presently really happening, at least from the perspective of the one who is speaking. But then you have outside, just like in English, outside of reality, you could have a subjunctive. Um, in Greek, you can have an optative, an imperative. You also have infinitive and participles, which are not necessarily moods, but we kind of throw them into the category of anything outside of the indicative. We're going to focus on the highlighted ones here. Subjunctive. So let's get some terminology in our minds. Subjunctive is the realm of probability or possibility in Greek. And that's, very, that's fairly equivalent to English. Instead of saying, I am running, I say, I may run. What's the difference? Yeah, it might happen. It's not really happening right now, but it might happen. It may happen. Um, let me also throw in some uh, some English grammar here. Because it took me learning Greek before I realized how to properly use this. That's my uh, Illinois and Missouri public school education for you. Um, <laughs> You use may when your verb is a, uh, so like with, let's say, he prays in order that if your verb of the main clause is present, you would say may. He prayed in order that he might. And then I think future is usually may as well. Uh, he will go in order that he may. Uh, so may and might is really a difference of what is the main verb that precedes it. Is it 
future, present, past. Past, you switch to might. Um, and there's more to that. I'd have to look at my notes. That's off the top of my head. But that, that's why I, I sometimes say might whenever I'm using a present, and I shouldn't. But um, that's really, as I understand it, why you would shift between may and might with that kind of a expression. And so in Greek, they don't necessarily have that helping word, so it doesn't really matter. But we have to then express that in English. And proper English would say if you have a past tense Greek verb, and then you have a subjunctive with it, you need to use might. If you have a present or future, um, you need to use may. All right, so non-indicative verbs express not time, but aspect. Now, we talked about, in Greek, the difference between time and aspect, and how that aspect is primary in Greek, and time is secondary, whereas in English, time is primary with tense, and aspect is secondary. And usually we have to change the word a little bit to try to express either continuous or non or in undefined action. When you get outside the indicative, you have no concept of time. And if you think about that, that's kind of true in English. I may go to the store. Well, you think probably possibility of future. But if you said he prayed in order that he may, he prays in order that he may, you're you're not really talking about a specific time anymore. You're talking your your main verb probably gives you the time, but your subjunctive verb doesn't give you time. It's just conceptual almost. It's outside of time. We may apply some time to it that well if he's praying now in order that he may, that's either in order that he may receive something when he prays or something that he'll receive in the future, probably not something he would have received in the past, but you have that concept even in English. And so time is only in the indicative in Greek. Um, so we'll, we'll notice that as we move through. So let's talk about the subjunctive. And again, I want us to think subjunctive possibility, subjunctive possibility or probability. Uh, let's get those, the terminology in our mind, because when we look at our interlinear and it says subjunctive, we need to know this is what a subjunctive is. So a subjunctive mood is one step removed from reality, and it can express purpose or condition. So in Greek, if you had the word in order that for purpose, you're going to have a subjunctive verb that follows it, because it's showing intentionality, in order that he may. If you have an if clause, uh, you're probably going to have a subjunctive. If I go to the store, are you really going to the store? Not at present, reality? No, it, if this should happen, then this will happen. And so if um, will usually have a subjunctive attached to it because it's outside the realm of reality, outside the realm of time. It's just if this, then this. So let's look an example of purpose. Uh, someone read for us in English, Mark 3.14. Mark 3.14, who wants to read that for us? And these are going to be subjunctive verbs that are translated, or subjunctive Greek verbs translated in English. Mark 3.14, all right, Andrew? All right, that they, what? that they should be with him. So you notice that you have, he's selecting them in order that something might happen and something may happen. Um, you have here the realm of purpose. And so it's probability, possibility, but it's outside of reality. And so it's in order that this may happen, or I think your translation say, in order that they should be with him. Um, we could also translate that in order that they, is it a past tense verb before it? Yes, in order that they might be with him would be another way to say that. So should, might, those are the English words we could use to show we're outside of reality. This is purpose. This is kind of conceptual, if you will. Now let's look at Matthew 8, 2. 8, 2. Can I ask for a different rendering of Mark 3, 14? Sure. Because it, it, it does not seem to indicate quite the same way. When he appointed the 12, this is LG, by the way, uh, whom he also named apostles, Yeah. 
But what they're doing in the LSB is they are translating a subjunctive as an infinitive to show purpose to be with him. That's, that's English. You can decide, do you want to say in order that they might be with him or to be with him? Both of those express purpose in English. So you have some flexibility in English of how you present this one purpose clause in Greek. So we can appreciate what our translators are doing. They're, they're trying to figure out what is the intent of this. And they're saying, it's purpose. This is why he is doing this. So let's translate the subjunctive in this way. All right. And what we're trying to do is get to where we can say, they did a good job with that. Or we need to refine that a little bit. All right, Matthew 8, 2. All right, Michael. And behold, a leper, or excuse me, and behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. All right. Which part of that verse do you think is the conditional part? If. If. If what? If you will. If you will. Now, Jesus is going to show that he really is willing, but from the perspective of the one speaking, he says, if you are willing. No, the, so the are willing verb would be in the subjunctive. He doesn't know if he's willing. It's outside of reality. So it's if this, then I know you can make me clean, is basically the sense of it. And so the are willing verb in Greek would be subjunctive because it's if you are willing. So if that is in the realm of possibility, probability, if this, then this. Thoughts, comments, questions? It, if would be there, but if you have the if word, then you're going to have a subjunctive verb to follow it. Um, so, but in English, we don't really do that. We don't say, if he may be willing, we just say, if you are willing, and we understand it to be outside of the realm of reality. They would have actually used a subjunctive uh, explicitly, whereas we kind of implicitly, it is subjunctive in English, we just don't use the same tags as we do with other subjunctives. I, I, I think it's basically following the English cues, but I, you know, we'll, we'll have some expressions, but I think it tends to be more to convey the idea that it's unlikely. Yes, it's still it's still unreality, but you can you can convey it's probably going to happen versus ah, it's probably not going to happen, and I'm trying to come up with a uh, un, uh, unless it be that I. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll have some strange constructions that, that right. occasionally we, if somebody doesn't do it right, we think, <laughs> right. <laughs> and this, this would probably be late first year Greek if you're taking a one year course. Um, we can express some things in ways that they express the same idea, but in different ways. Like, if I were to go to the store, I would buy bread. But the implication is, I'm not going to the store, and I'm not buying bread. Uh, they do that as well. It's called a second-class conditional sentence. They frame it a little bit different, but that's how we translate it. Of, um, let me think of an example of one. Um, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. That's a second-class conditional in Greek saying, if you had been here, but you weren't, then my brother would not have died, but he did. And so you have those all over the place in the New Testament. But you have those different kinds of conditions. One of the main ones is going to be if with a subjunctive to show you're outside of the realm of possibility. You're in the realm of condition. Um, we're not going to talk much about the optative. It's very rare. If you think there are over 5,000 words, different words that are used in the New Testament, that's not counting all the different forms. I think you're somewhere in the... I can't remember how many thousands of words are in the Greek New Testament uh, off the top of my head. 68 of them are optative. So you're talking a very low percentage of words in the New Testament are optative, but they, and it was kind of transitioning out of the Greek language, but the optative was even one more step removed. The most common is the word that Paul, the phrase Paul uses, miyenito, miyenito, may it never be, or God forbid, or uh, I can't remember the other translation that sometimes used, but literally, um, let me get my mi yenito. This is an optative verb from yinome, which means to be or to become. 
and so me is the negative. Um, so it's may it never be. I, uh, so that's probably the best way to translate it. May it never be, may it never become, may it never happen is kind of the idea. And so we have different ways of translating that in English, but it's one step removed. It's not just, this is the realm of possibility. This is the realm of, I, I even wish that this would never happen. Paul uses the optative as well, if I remember correctly, in Romans where he says, I could wish myself accursed from Christ. Um, it's not even the realm of possibility. It's one step removed from that reality of possibility. He, he knows he can't accurse himself for other people, but he is expressing that. So it's interesting when you come across it, but it's very rare, and so we're not going to talk too much about it. Any questions or comments about the subjunctive? So what's our key word? Subjunctive is the realm of possibility, and usually it expresses one of two things, either con condition or purpose. All right, very good. Imperative. Uh, what's an imperative in English? It's a command. It's a command. It's the same thing in English we're, or in Greek. We're going to use that terminology. An imperative is a command form, and they have specific command forms, and in a sense we do. We usually drop the you whenever we command. It, we could say you rejoice, and usually what that means to us is they're rejoicing. So you are rejoicing is kind of the idea. But if you just say rejoice, what does that mean? You're telling them to rejoice. And so you have a command. In, English, or in Greek, what's interesting is they not only have the you rejoice command, but they also have the he, she, it rejoice command. So you can command a third person. Um, you usually don't command yourself in Greek. Uh, you're actually going to use a form of the subjunctive to do that, to say uh, in fact, Hebrews is full of it. It's called the hortatory subjunctive. Um, th this is a fun word, so let's learn it. The hortatory subjunctive. What happens if we put a X on the front? What do you think that means? Exhort. <laughs> so you're exhorting us. Um, so it's a hortatory subjunctive. All those, I think almost every time you see in the book of Hebrews, let us hold fast to our confession. Let us provoke one another. It's what you do to command in the first person. Let us do this. Um, so you have all those let us verbs. Those are not imperatives because you don't have a first person imperative, a first person command, but you do have a first person subjunctive. So I'm saying that you can express kind of a light command in Greek, but the true commands are either going to be you do this or let him do this. Uh, what's that song uh, typically associated with Christmas? Um, Let angels prostrate fall. Um, that would, if it were written in Greek, that would be a third person command. And that's the best we can do in English is let this happen. The problem with the word let is what does that usually convey in English? Permission, allowance. What you're really trying to com express there is angels must fall. What's interesting is you have the third person imperative in the Lord's Prayer, where we say, uh, let our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name is a third person imperative, third person command. Your name must be sanctified, is what that is literally. Give us this day our daily bread. That's an imperative. You give us this day our daily bread. Um, Forgive us our debts. And so, but notice there that you do have the third person. Your name must be sanctified. Your kingdom must come is the idea because it's an imperative form. Now, think about that. We don't have time to think about it together as a class, but you are expressing commands to God when you pray. Your kingdom must come. Your will must be done. Give us this day our daily bread. You're recognizing his superiority and that he doesn't have to do this, but you would use a command form to address God in a prayer. Um, so you have the second person form and the third person form. You can see those both in Matthew 5, or 3, 2, and 11, 5. Imperatives in Greek will occur in either the present or the aorist tenses. Now, again, we're outside of the indicative, so we're not talking time. When you say, uh, give us this day our daily bread, that's an aorist verb. But you're looking at the whole, because you're not saying, you have given us, 
you're commanding it for something in the future, but it's the idea of God, Jesus, when he prays that, doesn't use any present tenses. So it's almost like, as a whole, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. I don't think it's just single point action, but he just wants to think about the verb. He doesn't want you to think about God continuously forgive us. He doesn't use the present tense. So again, this is where we get back to outside of the indicative. We have to think totally in aspect, not time. Because if you give a command, you're really always looking future in time. But they'll use the present or the aorist to show present, either continuous action or aorist to show conceptual, whole action. All right. Um, let's look at, since we're running out of time, let's look at 1 Peter 4.13. 4, 4.13. Can someone read that for us in English? First Peter four thirteen. Who has that? But rejoice and go far as you are. You share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. All right. What's the imperative at the very beginning? Rejoice. rejoice. He's telling them to rejoice and command. Now I give you the information that you would get in an interlinear. That is a verb. It is a present verb, uh, it's middle, uh, oh, imp sorry, imperative, present active imperative, I was getting off on my uh, tags there, second person plural. What is second person plural? Y'all, there's our word. So y'all, he's not just talking to one Christian, he's talking to all his audience, so y'all, Rejoice. Now, he could have chose an aorist tense. Rejoice as you are suffering. Think about the whole action. He uses the present. So he's saying, as you are undergoing all these difficulties, all of you better keep on rejoicing. See the difference in aspect there? That he's not just saying rejoice. So what would we do in English? Well, a strict word-for-word -word translation would just be rejoice. And then let the interpreter, the, the preacher or the teacher, present the idea behind the present tense. Or some translations will say, keep on rejoicing. Now, is that a strict word-for-word -word translation? No, but it gives the sense of a present imperative. I want you to keep on rejoicing in the midst of these trials. So see the little nuance there? See how it's interesting to start thinking through the aspect of the present, the aorist. Um, there's not a perfect imperative in the New Testament, as far as I remember. Um, to our future. So you have the, the imperative here is the verb of command, uh, the, or excuse me, the mood of command, and it is not reality. It's outside of reality, but it is commanding. It's intention, uh, pur purpose in a sense that you're saying, do this. So backing up one, or to our chart here, we're going to talk um, more about some other forms in, in the next class. But what I want you to get is subjunctive is probability, possibility, usually with a condition or purpose. Imperative is a command, and you can have it in second or third person. So you rejoice or let him rejoice or let you all rejoice would be second person plural or let them rejoice, third person plural. And then what you have to do from there is whenever you start seeing these imperatives, which would be labeled by an M, or you see a subjunctive, you have to start thinking, what is being expressed by the aspect of the verb? Is this continuous action? Is this undefined action? And that might give you some insights into what the author is trying to get you to think about. Um, why did Jesus use an aorist tense for the, for the prayer? Maybe he doesn't want you to think of this prayer as kind of a one-time, give us everything we need. But then why use a present tense with rejoice? Because he doesn't want you to stop rejoicing in the midst of difficulties. Keep on rejoicing. Any comments or questions before we close out there? All right, appreciate everyone's participation. Remember, we're just learning terminology here. And when we get to uh, the probably the second half of December, we're going to start applying it by showing how to do good word studies with what we're learning here. All right, appreciate it.